this letter being unofficial and private, I may with safety give you a more extensive view of our policy respecting the Indians. We shall push our trading uses and be glad to see the good and influential individuals among them run in debt, because we observe that when these debts get beyond what the individuals can pay, they become willing to lop them off by a session of lands. It always started with removing tribes from land that whites wanted to occupy. And then a treaty would be negotiated. The treaty would involve money. It would, it would call for money to be paid in compensation to the tribes. The Dakota were very willing in light of the fact that their game was hunted out because of the fur trade, they became increasingly reliant on the U.S. government. That treaty would be approved by the Congress. Once it was approved by the Congress, an annuity fund would be set up in trust in Washington. From that moment on, the sharp operators out in the field could tap that money. In 1849, Alexander Ramsey came to Minnesota as the first territorial governor. The first thing he did coming to Minnesota was he wanted to make a treaty and he wanted the Dakota to sell all this land in basically the southern half of Minnesota. But to, to do that, he needed help. Who has all the power with the Indian or the Dakota people? It's Henry Hastings Sibley. The Indians are prepared to make a treaty when we tell them to do so. And such a one as I may dictate. After they signed the treaty, the chiefs were brought over to Joe Brown's table. He had the Indians sign a paper. They thought it was a copy of the treaty, but actually it was called the trader's paper. And it said that the traders could take whatever money they thought was right out of the treaty money. And Sibley put in a claim for overpayments, overpayments to the Sioux, and he got it. He got $145,000, that's worth about $4 million. And so Sibley became a rich man and went, on and went into politics and became the first governor of Minnesota. The Dakota were almost like bystanders in their own treaty making. It was a system, that's what they called it, an Indian system. And it ran on money then that money could be tapped by all kinds of people who were not native. And it was a pathway to power, that's what I would emphasize, that in the West, people who were ambitious and wanted to go into politics could make money out of the Indian system and then go into politics. The government actually sent out an investigator. His name was George E.H. Day. Mr. President, I have discovered numerous violations of law and many frauds committed by past agents and a superintendent. The Indians whom I have visited in this state and Wisconsin have been defrauded of more than $100,000 in or during the four years past. The whole system is defective and must be revised. He came back with, with reports on all the corruption that was going on and he predicted that it would lead to war if it weren't changed. Bishop Henry Whipple had decided to set up an Episcopal mission at the lower agency. He knew the conditions on the reservation. He knew that this war was related to robbery and fraud. Bishop Whipple saw how the Indian system worked. He said it commences in discontent and ends in blood. Of $96,000 due to the Lower Sioux, not one cent has ever been received. All has been absorbed in claims. Whipple's big argument was it was all politics, that what we had to do to fix the system so that it didn't lead to war and it did in Minnesota, that you had to depoliticize the system. You had to have professional agents, not politicians and not political appointees. Lincoln did work the system. He made the appointments. His main political cronies were put in the key places in the Indian system. It's hard to argue that Lincoln was as corrupt as some of them, but he certainly participated in the system that was enormously corrupt. We are not babies to be fooled so. 
The traders have got all of our money. Tell our great father that it is hard for him to expect our hearts to be good when he permits men with bad hearts to do so wrong so often. After all these treaties and after all these corrupt practices, in the summer of 1862, they had virtually nothing. They, they were starving. This is why when the day came to decide whether to go to war or not, Little Crow said, if you want to go to war, I'll go with you. Because basically he was saying, I've given up having faith in the U.S. government. After this war was all over, there was warfare throughout the plains. The, the Indian tribes that were removed from Minnesota were pursued and killed right and left, and Lincoln no longer paid any attention. We always talk about the executions of the 38, but how many hundreds, maybe thousands, more died in the aftermath of that war. The whole relation between the Indian tribes and the United States is the most ridiculous possible. And I hope someday or other, a gentleman familiar with the subject will bring in a bill abolishing the whole system. This glorification of the Indian character and the poetic tale of his wrongs inflicted by this government in the purchase of their lands is a phantom of the poetic brain. We have paid to these Indians and invested for their benefit millions in money if they refuse to merge into and become part of the superior race, they must necessarily be destroyed. It is a law of humanity. This war did not need to happen. It was totally preventable 